I greet you all in the very blessed name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now let us turn our Bibles to the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. As promised, I will do a quick revision and summary so that we do not leave this series on the Beatitudes of our prayer meeting, um, forgetting what we've learned. It's going to be just a summary, and I hope that you recall key lessons that the Lord has taught you. Taught you. But we want to have a clear overall picture, all right, before we leave the Beatitudes. Let us first and foremost turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for safe journeys to thy house. Thank you for seeing us through the day. And above all, we thank you for this great privilege, for your call to come to the house of prayer. And Lord, we do plead once, and once again for the thorough cleansing and washing of all our sins. And Lord, we pray that you would help us as we review the lessons we've learned from the Beatitudes. Lord, that we may once again be refreshed in our minds and go forth into the world to live them out for you. So grant to us the attentiveness of heart. Lord, though it be a revision, Lord, may your Holy Spirit use it mightily, Lord, to confirm our convictions in how we ought to live in this world. Father, we pray for all this, that we may be people that would truly reflect Christ as we walk and sojourn on this planet. We ask and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Matthew chapter 5. So the revision is most likely going to be quick, but so please try and pay attention and follow along, right? I do have to move rel relatively quickly. Now, first and foremost, you know that this is called the Beatitude, and it is from the Latin word, all right, from a Latin word where we, we, we get this word, Beatitude, but the meaning is, well, happy, blessed, as the Bible would put it, or blessedness, all right, happiness. Of course, it is talking about spiritual happiness, so that is the first thing that we must remember. So whenever we see blessed, it's talking about, well, the blessing from God, the blessing of a, of a happy life. All right. Now, then the question is, what is this happiness? Because the world looks for happiness as well. Now, over here, this happiness is one that is first and foremost spiritual. First and foremost, spiritual happiness. Now, of course, spiritual happiness will also translate to your happiness, your physical happiness on earth. But it doesn't necessarily mean that if you're sad on earth, then you are not blessed. All right, we'll see that. We'll see that soon. So blessedness is, a, is a, um, a spiritual blessing from God. Now, whenever, when God says, I bless you, it's different from us saying, God, we bless your name, all right? When we say, we bless your name, God, as the psalmist would write, it refers to us praising, honoring, exalting, all right? Uh, praising the name of God. But whenever God uses bless upon people, upon his people, well, he has three key connotations. So when we talk about the Beatitudes, if you live by them, these three connotations are for you, all right? When God blesses, he's thinking of, well, his, <clears throat> his thoughts towards you are, are good, favorable. First and foremost, it's about his thoughts towards you. When he says, I bless you, his thoughts towards you. Then it talks about his responses towards you. Not just he think about something and don't do anything, and right? doesn't do anything, all right? His responses towards you. And then, now, with all that, his thoughts and his responses towards you to bring about a favorable circumstance. Favorable circumstance spiritually, all right? Spiritually favorable circumstance in your life. So something that in the eyes of the world may not be favorable, but it is a favorable, spiritual, favorably, uh, favorable situation. So his thoughts towards you, he's pleased with you. So when God says, bless you, so he is pleased with you. Right? So I'm saying on the thoughts, he desires, his desires towards you are, are that he wants to bless you more. Right? He has good thoughts towards you. He wants to do more for you. So when God says, well, bless you, that those are his thoughts, his thoughts. Then his, with respect to his responses towards you, he will help you. Right? He intends to help you. He will provide for you. He will protect you. Right? He will hear your prayers. So that, those will be his responses towards you when he bless you. 
And then ultimately, the favorable circumstances is, well, he will lead you and guide you, all right, into his will, and he will use you. So these are things that we must remember about beatitude, God's blessing. Now, never forget God's purpose for the blessing, all right? So whenever you think of beatitudes and God says, God, God will bless me for living this way, there is a purpose why God blesses the Christian. Always remember this. God does not bless you for your own reason, for your own personal benefit and just randomly. What are these purposes of God's blessings? Well, to enable us, all right, to enable us to live and grow in our spiritual life, right? Enabling the spiritual growth. That is a purpose. Now, another purpose is um, to enable us to be a good testimony, to help us to live out the testimony on earth. So God's purpose, God's blessing is always to help us achieve um, some of these things. What else? What are some other purposes? Well, to love Him more, right? To grow in your love for Him, to be more useful to Him, um, to serve Him better, to obey Him better, right? To follow His commandments um, um, and to give you faith and courage to obey Him, right? So God's purposes are always spiritual in His blessings. So whenever we sing hymns, all right, and then you see, you sing hymns that, that talks about, well, go, talk about God blessing His people or God want to bless you or that, um, that we are joyful and all that when we receive God's blessings. Now, we should not forget that these hymn writers, most of them at least, all right, they write at the time where this health and wealth gospel is non-existent. So when they talk about the joy that God desires for His children, the, the God's desire to bless His people, God de God's desire to grant to them the, the prayers of their heart, when they write hymns like that and when you sing them, you must always remember these blessings that they write about. They have in mind those spiritual purposes. With the health and wealth gospel, many people who sing even the old hymns, they misunderstand the hymn writers. They think that, oh, God, God is going to um, answer all my prayers and whatever I want in my heart for my life on earth to be whatever I want, oh, this hymn is talking about that. No, the beatitude, when they sing about all these things, they're talking about the beatitude, the blessings that are spiritual, right? So don't assume that they think like us. So sing with that understanding. Sometimes when we sing hymns, I, I, I'm concerned that we think, oh, God is going to answer all my prayers and I'm, I'm going to be a, a Christian with no problems in my life. My healing, my exams, my finances, they will all be, be um, um, pros prospering, right? So beatitudes, the blessings, is always one that has spiritual purposes. Well, ultimately, we know the chief end of men. That is to glorify God. All of God's blessings are for us to use, to, to use, to glorify Him in life. All right? Now, so that is the summary for um, blessed. Blessed. I hope we do not forget that. Now, let's come to the first one, right? And that is found in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit. If one thing that must come to your mind whenever you think of poor in spirit, remember the word poor, all right? The emphasis on the word poor. Maybe ask, do you remember what is the key thing, the, the words that is used to describe? Uh, Shane, do you remember? Beggar. Beggar, very good. The first thought that comes to, to your mind is beggarly, all right? Poor in spirit. And the word is, is used to describe, for example, Lazarus. Now, but is it just like the beggars that you see um, in town here. Now, I'm not saying that their life is not difficult and that they're, they're not poor. But this beggarly aspect is, is not just, well, lacking in some things. It's not even lacking in many things. This poor in spirit is, is a thinking in your heart that you're destitute, all right? You have, you have nothing. You are nothing. You can do nothing, all right? The Christian must realize that God says, when you have that 
when you reach a stage in your heart where you really can, you really know, you acknowledge and you sense that you are truly nothing, well, then you are blessed. You are blessed. It is a picture of the beggar crouching, all right, on the floor, cringing, all right, reaching his hand out towards someone walking by, just and so, so ashamed to even look up, just begging. I am not worthy to ask anything. All right, the utter a state of heart is I am so unworthy before God and man. I am so unworthy. That is very contrary to the culture today. Today it's all about self-esteem. All right? You must think that you are so good. You must have self-confidence. But the very first thing that God says, Christians, when you are saved, I want you to know this. This is where I start. The poverty of spirit, all right? This is a picture of someone who feels so unworthy that even when he goes before God, all right, he doesn't have any sense that he's worthy to come to God at all. You know, many of the beggars, they avoid certain areas because they feel that they're not worthy um, to be in those areas. It's that kind of feeling, all right? Now, then, what are some of the key learnings? Right, so this beggar, right, beggarly, destitute beggar, not just somewhat l missing some things in life. The key learning, well, real happiness lies in recognizing and embracing our utter need for God in everything. Real happiness for the Christian life comes through the recognizing and embracing of our utter need for God in everything in every moment in life. This is the kind of picture that the particular word of beggar, all right? Now, it is, well, one way to put it, it is a utter humility, all right? A genuine utter humility and awareness, awareness of our spiritual inadequacy. There is no pride at all. No matter how, how well People even praise us, you are so godly, you are so holy, compared to so many people, right? When you hear that in your heart, all you feel and you feel, all you feel genuinely is, how can you even say that you don't know who I, I am so utterly unworthy? My spiritual life is so lacking, right? So, now you think of the Apostle Paul. Think of the Apostle Paul. He was such an incredible, all right? sample of a Christian on earth. I think next to Christ himself, of course, Christ is perfect. The next person that you say, I really feel that I really look up to is Apostle Paul, but yet he would say, I'm the least. I'm the least among the apostles. He's the one who cried out, oh, wretched man that I am. And here is the Apostle Paul. Is it little wonder why God would use him so mightily? All right, so that's the first one. Now, the second thing is, is with that, there is an end to self, end to self, and hope. All our hope is in God, an end to self. There is no feeling that, Lord, I can do this, I can do that on my own. It's an absolute, Lord, I am undone. I totally cling to you and depend on you. This end to self begins the utter dependence on Christ. Hence, Christ said, when you become a believer, or if you want to come, become a believer, I need you to understand this. You must come to an end of yourself and a total dependence on me for salvation, for a start, and then to live the Christian life. It is a sense that, Lord, without you, I will fall. You know the hymn is saying? Without him, I will fall. These people write with genuineness. Are we really genuine like that? Well, one test is this. Do you pray in everything? Do you pray without ceasing? The test of this sense that you utterly are helpless, without strength, and you need God in everything, in every thought, is found in how much you pray. The beggar does not stop begging. 
The beggar keeps kneeling there and keeps pleading and pleading and pleading every day. He eats something, then he goes back to begging. Because if he constantly feels, knows I have nothing. Your prayer life is a reflection of whether you really believe you are poor in spirit. Before you go to school, how much do you cling to God? Before you go to work, many of us, we experience after some time, but initially we cling to God when we arrive in Perth, when we first started our jobs, all right? when, we, when we just have the first kid. We cling to Him. And after some time, we, we know what to do. When we experience God's help, instead of knowing that it was God's help, I'm still a beggar. I have no strength on my own. All right, so prayer is one good test of how really destitute you feel about your life, yourself, your strength. Now, then the next thing, the next thing we learned, some of the key lessons, we learned many things, all right? You can go back and listen to all of them, but I'm just drawing out some which I feel, I hope that we remember. There is, well, no sense of entitlement. <clears throat> we just covered that on Sunday. You would not come to God feeling that God must answer your prayers. You will never say, God, why did you not answer my prayers? You will not have any feeling without in your heart to say, God, I, I can't understand after all that I've done, living in obedience, serving you, giving. A beggar never comes to a person and say, you know, I, I expect you to give me something. A beggar simply knows, I, have even, I do not even have a right to be in front of you to ask for something. Is that our attitude when we come before God? God is a loving God. God wants us to come before Him. God calls His children to come. That is why you are here tonight. But it doesn't mean that every time we come, we come flippantly, we come irreverently, we come with a sense of self-entitlement. We come knowing that the loving God of heaven invites us beggars and we come with that humility to Him. All right? So God says this is that beggarly, I am, I can't make a move without falling unless, God, you guide me, you help me. Every choice that I make, I have no wisdom, God. I will make the wrong choices if you do not guide me with your word. The beggar will eat up God's word hungrily. The beggar will not only just pray, or he will cling to every single morsel of, of God's wisdom in God's word because he knows he knows he will make the wrong choice if he do not, if he does not depend on God that way. This beggar feels that I cannot make it on my own at all. Even for the next hour on earth, God, I need you with me, by my side. I need you to constrain me. I need you to guide me. All right? Now then, this, this beggar, another concept of the beggar is the beggar doesn't choose means this. He doesn't, he accepts whatever is given to him. A beggar does not, why do you give me this? I want the other things that you have in your house, in your pocket. Whatever, well, David was an example. Whatever is left in your hands, I'm grateful for it. All right, so this poor in spirit is an attitude where God, whatever you choose for my life, because I'm a beggar, as beggars, I cannot be choosers. I am thankful for what, whatever outcome you chose for my life, for be it my health, my education, my, my, um, my, my finances, my job. I simply and joyfully receive and embrace anything that you give me, right? Now, the blessings, the blessings. We know it is about the kingdom of heaven, for there shall be the kingdom of heaven. Anyone remember what this is about, the kingdom of heaven? We don't have time, so I shall, not, I shall just um, download, all right? Now, whenever we talk about the kingdom of heaven, well, of course, it, it, many of us will think about salvation. We will be part of the kingdom of heaven, heaven, all right? Um, uh, the kingdom of God, heaven. So, so we, are, we will have salvation only when we are truly poor in spirit. Lord, I cannot do a single thing to wash away one single sin. I'm utterly unworthy. I'm totally dependent on you. Yes, that's the promise. That's the blessing. Eternal joy in the presence of God. But for the believer, 
whenever we read the kingdom of heaven, all right? Kingdom, kingdom must make you think of four things, all right? The kingdom of God will immediately make you, make you realize the presence of God. The blessing of one that is poor in spirit will be the presence of God. The presence of God. Well, there is the hereafter, which is eternal life, but the presence of God here as well, the kingdom of God, the unseen kingdom of God on earth, the presence of God. Now, the second P is the provision of God. Just now we spoke of that, the provisions of God. Now, whatever is best for you, he will provide. So this happiness is, God, I want to be this, I want to be that. So, so God, please, I beg you, I really cannot be um, a CEO, so please help me. Of course, it is not that. The provision is according to his will, what is best for you, all right? And then there is the protection, the protection. Now, one big protection is this. The Bible constantly warns before before a fall, right? What is before a fall? Pride. Pride cometh before a fall. The protection of falling is only when you are utterly so afraid to make every single choice in your life without praying, without seeking God's wisdom in His Word, His guidance in His Word, confirming it. You dare not make a single move, a choice. That's why you are protected. Right? The protection. And God will also protect your life. God will also protect um, your properties. Why? Because it is, if God wants you to have life, health, and property, because you want to use it to serve Him, and he, intend, he gave them to you for the purpose of serving Him, He will protect them. Parents, you want God to protect your child? Bring up your child for the Lord. If you want to bring up the child for yourself, then why would God want to protect the child? Some parents cry to God, God, heal my child, heal my child. Right? Help my child in this, help my child in that. When the child is healed and all that, well, the child is used for the world. Right? So, but when you are poor in spirit, God, we, we deserve nothing. Right? I cry to you for this child to be used of you. Now, the last P is um, this, a privilege. Right? The kingdom of heaven is where the believer experiences the privileges of God, the privilege of everything that you need for holiness, for godliness, for doing His will, will never be denied. How wonderful is that privilege? You, some people say, I wish I joined this company or the other company because they provide training. They provide everything. That, wow, I have so privileged to work in such a company. Well, when we live for God in this utter um, sense that God I have I need I need you to do your will well God will use you is the second privilege God will use God only uses those that are poor in spirit the poorer you are in spirit the more God will use you the un why the answer is obvious why would God use someone who is proud I can do this after you accomplish something in your heart and in your, on, on your mouth, you tell people how great and how clever you are, right? It is those that really realize, God, I have nothing. And even if I did anything, it's purely because you provided, you protected, and it was my privilege. People who are poor in the spirit will find no lack in service um, that God will give to them, all right? Then lastly, this, this, the privilege of, well, all the privileges of understanding the word. Those who are poor in spirit, they will be very humble, right? They, 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 will, they will just um, ask, God, God, can you help me understand? Well, they will grow spiritually because they will acknowledge their weaknesses, their spiritual weaknesses to God. They won't feel that I am so strong. God says, he that thinketh that he standeth, take heed lest he fall, right? They will know. The wonderful privilege of God strengthening them, helping them to overcome sin. No understanding His Word. The more you want people to know God, the more God will help you understand His Word. Because you don't understand, you don't want to understand His Word to be proud. You want to understand His Word because you want others to know Him. You want others to love Him. Well, and ultimately, there is um, this 
this poor in, people who are poor in spirit um, have the wonderful privilege of, of um, the gifts of God, right? The gifts of God. The poorer you are, the more willing you are to beg from God, and your purposes are always spiritual. I mentioned just now, Paul was rich in spiritual gifts. If you read the lives of the, the, lives of the apostles, you will find that God gives the Apostle Paul so much gifts, right? Excelling the most in gifts, but yet he considers himself the least of the apostles, all right? So that is the blessedness, all right? The blessedness um, of those that are poor in spirit. It begins here. Please do not forget that. It begins here. Now then we move to the second bless, um, beatitude that is found in verse 4. Blessed are they that mourn, that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they that mourn, all right? Now what is this mourning? We have the picture of poor in spirit is, is a destitute beggar, all right? Not just a beggar, but a destitute beggar. Now this is a picture of someone that is, that is deeply broken in the heart. It's a picture of someone who is crying, wailing at a funeral, all right? So God used this particular word to describe this mourning, all right? So deep, so passionate, and it is like someone who is so distressed at a funeral, right? Weeping, crying, in deep sorrow, lamenting, grieving. Now, this is the picture. So, so you know, I, to help you remember, I said in, the, in, the, in those days, right, they, they even pay people to go and cry at funerals. I think in some countries they still do, right? Of course, God is not talking about that, that you get paid to do that. But even the people, they say, we want to see this kind of scene at a funeral. Right? That deep distress, moaning, wailing, wailing at a funeral. So that is the meaning of this, this word. Now, what are some of um, the key learnings? Well, what is this um, mourning over? All right, mourning, what is this mourning over? Now, it's the mourning over our, um, our sins, first and foremost. Our sins and our sinfulness. Are we saved and we are going to heaven? Yes, if you're truly saved, you are going to heaven. Are your sins all washed away positionally in Christ? You are sanctified and you're ready to, for heaven immediately. If you die now, yes, you are. All right? But yet God says, blessed are they that mourn. Why mourn over our sins? It's all forgiven. I'm going to heaven. Now the question about why we mourn over our sins is sometimes in some area of Christianity a big question mark. You are saved already. God has already forgiven. Why do you even confess your sin, right? We saw that in the hyper grace. You want to confess, it's fine. But you really, as a Christian, you do not need to confess sins anymore. They are all forgiven. Now, the Christian must know, although our sins are all forgiven and we are going to heaven, but we still continue to sin in this flesh on earth. And every time we think about that, we grieve because we have, we have disappointed God, the God that loved us and died for us. We grieve because we just feel, and we're so frustrated. If only I could walk perfectly on earth before him. But we know there's no sinless perfection till heaven. That's why the Apostle Paul was so frustrated with himself, so upset with himself, because he knows that he constantly Though saved and will go to heaven, yet disappoints the loving God. You know, the more you realize how much God has forgiven you and you're going to heaven and yet we sin, that must bring the greatest grief to our heart. How can I grieve the heart of the loving God? This is not about, well, fear of um, displeasing an angry God. This is a sadness in our heart that we've displeased a loving God. So this is, this is the heart, all right? This is what we must learn. How, when was the last time you mourned over your sin, dear friends? I think many of us can, can think of the last time that we sin, this very sin that we promised God we will not sin anymore. 
But each time we do, do we mourn over them? When was the last time that you experienced such mourning before God? God, I've sinned again. Oh God, I, I, I was afraid. I had, no faith. I had no faith. God, I sinned against you in words, in deeds, in action. Right? The confession is not one of just, just knowledge. So this morning is one of the heart that is broken. When, Peter's, when Peter denied Christ and Christ looked at him, what did he do? The Bible tells us that he wept. No, the Bible says he wept bitterly. Wept bitterly. Every time we come before God and we know we have sinned against him. And we, we sin against him so often if we really think about them. We must imagine Christ looking at us like Christ looked at Peter. When Peter professed his love and devotion and faithfulness, I will never, I will never. We bow before him and say, God, I said I will never again, but I've done it again. Where is the weeping bitterly? Peter felt that. Just imagine when you kneel before Christ tonight. Lord, all those things that I've promised, I broke all my promises. Just imagine Christ looking at us. Christ does not look at us with, with a hatred. He looked at Peter, feeling the grief, the betrayal. Every time we sin, it's a betrayal of him who loved us with his soul. All right, so the bitterness of, the, the, the sadness of having dishonored, having dishonored the name of Christ, living worldly lives, dishonors him. We must have a holy lamentation of our lack of holiness, all right? So this is, this is that kind of sense that arises in us having offended God, disappointed God, brought grief to his heart, wounded his heart, his loving heart. Now, we like to gloss over sin. We like to just ignore sin and don't think about this. But before that, I want to say godly sorrow. This is about godly sorrow, right? Godly sorrow. Now, godly sorrow is not sorrow over consequences of sin. Please know the difference. This, this mourning, this grief is not just Oh, I've sinned against God. And then this consequence resulted, and then we feel very sad. We feel sad because of the pain to us, not to God. That is not godly sorrow. That is not this morning. This morning is how we have pained God's heart. David, when he sinned and when he confessed, all right? Actually, David, when he was in sin, for the months we, when he did not confess his sin and repent of, of it before God, when, when, he was going, when he was carrying this without confession, you read the Psalms. He said, my, my, my bones, all right, in the bones in him, his flesh and all, they were like withered, all right? That is the kind of lamenting and, and, and burden he, bad, he bore in his, in his body when he did not confess sin. Do we have that? Now, don't forget that um, um, God says, after poor in spirit, then he talk about mourning. When you are not poor in spirit, you will not mourn over your sins. All right, so that is um, the true sign, right, of, of, of mourning over sin, not just about the consequences. Now, I don't want us to forget this mourning is also a mourning over the sins of other people. When you look at Samuel, he mourned. He mourned over the state of Israel. Many of the prophets mourned over them. We have the weeping prophet, right? Saul, uh, sorry, uh, Paul, he constantly mourned over the state of the churches. He constantly worried about them. Our Lord Jesus, when he saw the lost, he wept. God on earth wept. There is a mourning a sadness. Now, that is a true sign of your love for God's kingdom. That is a true sign of your love for God's kingdom. When you're concerned to the point where you mourn, not just your, on your, your, own, um, your own sins. Now, then the question that we covered 
or is how to have this spirit. How to have this spirit? We realize that we are not this, but yet we realize this is the second beatitude. Anyway, since I got saved till now, I didn't even think that I should be a morning Christian. Another caveat before I answer that question is, now this is not going around with a long face all day long because some people are like that. It's pretentious. It's pretending to be holy. Right? I'm holy, so, so I must always be mourning. I'm always sinful, right? So I must always be mourning. The Bible also says, well, rejoice evermore. All right? And again, I say rejoice. Now, how, how do you reconcile that? Well, there is, there is the rejoicing of salvation. But at the, time, at the time when you rejoice about salvation, whenever you think about your sins, you also realize with that rejoicing, how can I sin against such great love? At the same time, you, you have the lamenting of how I wish I were more perfect for Christ, right? So this is not a pretending going around with a, a long face and uh, torturing yourself. Um, it is not that kind of things. Now, how to have such genuine mourning over our, our sinfulness, our grieving of God in so many ways, our lack of faith, our lack of love towards Him. Now, by and large, as human beings, we do not like to mourn. We do not like to have sad thoughts. In fact, that's the whole um, mental health approach, right? This is very contrary to mental health, you know, being poor in spirit. They say, no, have self-confidence. Then now here, it gets worse. Blessed are they that mourn. They say, no, don't, have, don't stress yourself. Have happy thoughts, right? Think well. Just, just avoid thinking of, of things that are unpleasant. But here is God saying the very contrary thing. Because it's, this is blessedness. As human beings, we do not like to mourn. So the first thing to develop this and to start having this is, well, turn off distractions. We love to be entertained. We love amusement. We love merrymaking. Why? Is it because we do not want to face who we are before God and how horrible our Christian life is before God? Is your Christian life currently what you know in your heart by the grace of God, what it should be, that is pleasing to God, that is bringing joy to God's heart? Student, adult, mother, father, child in school. Can you really honestly say, God, these decisions that I've made, what, I'm, what I've been doing, what I'm going to do, what I'm continuing in, is something is pleasing to you and is really good. We avoid thinking about thoughts and, and, and um, meditating on what am I really doing? What have I really chosen? What have I really done? So we have a lot of activities, keeping ourselves busy with many things because we want to avoid facing that question. Is, this some, is my life currently really pleasing to God? Turn off distractions of, well, activities just to dull that. Now, sometimes it can be meetings. Now, if you're someone who, do not, who does not like to be alone, you find that you just have to organize something. You just can't be alone. When you're home, you must have something on, whether the news or television or something. All right? You do not like quietness where you reflect in your own heart. The Bible says, Commune with your own heart upon your bed. Right? We go through, we flip through, um, I don't know whatever people flip through nowadays, TikTok or social media. We just entertain ourselves before we sleep. Because it's commune with your own heart. If you're someone who just finds that I just must keep organizing outings with people, being with someone, and even when with someone, there cannot be silence of reflection, we must be just doing something. And you always want to do something that's exciting. Don't want to talk about spiritual things because it will make you face what you do not want to obey God in. You avoid people who, 
who are spiritual because you know somehow it will convict you then you must know that you are avoiding this beatitude i do not want to mourn over my sins i want to gloss over it i want to avoid it i want to avoid thinking about this well turn off the entertainment turn off even the hobbies and say lord since i became a christian i have not mourned over my sins lord i'm setting all this aside i want to start lord spending time reflecting upon my walk with you my life when you begin to see that then you you and i will begin to see how ugly we are how disobedient we are parents you tell your children go to your room all right you take their their devices go to your room for the next hour spend some quiet time to reflect on what you just said reflect on what you just did we tell them to do that because we know it's effective they will come out feeling sorry we must do that all right set apart time sometimes people say let's go here let's go they say yeah, i think i don't have much time to reflect i want to have some time on my own now this is not an excuse to avoid church and avoid christian fellowship huh? god says um, neglect not assembling of yourselves it, all right now now the blessing we come to the blessing and that's i think as far as we can go the blessing now here the lord says blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted for they shall be comforted now this word comfort is like the word for the holy spirit comforter all right um, and it's from the word para kaleo para, para means alongside right calling all right god comes alongside you god calls you and comes alongside you all right so it is is it is that picture now i read to you a verse from psalm 34 verse 18 you can just copy it down the reference copy the reference down the lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as of a broken spirit now here god says he is close to the person that is of a broken heart you want to avoid you want to have god close to you god says a broken heart a heart that is mourning now can you be joyful and be mourning at the same time yes while you're rejoicing over salvation rejoicing over over the goodness of god but at the same time in your heart you remember all your failures towards god but God says, no, to such a person, I'm, I'm close to them. I save such a contrite spirit. And God says in Psalm 51, verse 17, now this is where, the, where David prayed at repentance. The sacrifices of God are a broken heart, a broken heart, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, thou will not despise. The world tells us, do not have such things. But God tells us, I will not despise such a heart. In fact, God is so pleased with such a heart. So I will be very close to you. A child that says, Daddy, Mommy, I am so unworthy to be your child. I'm so thankful for everything. I'm so grateful to you. And I constantly feel that I, I fail you so often. I don't know why you love me. You think a parent will say, yeah, you deserve it. You're right, you know, child. You know, I really wonder about that myself as well. No parent will say that. The parent will embrace the child when the parent knows that that is how the child feels he will embrace the child with love assuring the child i will help you that's why god say he will save such a such a heart he will save them i will help you now this this comfort what is the blessedness of this comfort well the restoration of fellowship the restoration of fellowship christian do not think that mourning is bad when you mourn that is when you confess and that is when god says all right you have acknowledged you understand you realize just like the child who says that the father will embrace lovingly restoration of fellowship whenever we sin and we will not confess we will not repent we want to avoid thinking about these things and you're a person who really want to just have be busy with things that to avoid all this well you must know that in the midst of well you're happy playing happy talking and all that your fellowship with god is broken your relationship with god as a child of god is never broken salvation is permanent the relationship will never be broken but your fellowship is broken how do you feel 
Do you have the sadness of heart that my fellowship with God is broken? Right? So the restoration of fellowship, the joy of restoration. That's why David prayed in Psalm 51. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. All right? The joy of salvation, not restore unto me salvation, but the joy is lost. Comfort of the deliverance from the power of sin. What is this blessedness? The deliverance from sin. You say, Pastor, how so? When you read the Bible, the true believers that turn to God in brokenness, they always repent. Because true mourning over sin is a sincere, genuine lamentation and grieving and sorrow and hatred over that sin, which naturally brings repentance. The true believer who mourns over sin takes the time to mourn over sin is a believer that God says for the contrite heart, I saveth such of be of a contrite spirit, is the one that God delivers from the power of that sin. When you know that you still love that sin, flirt with that sin, you do not want to confess. You do not feel that it's so horrible and heinous. You have not reached a stage of mourning over it. But when you do, God will deliver you from it. Save us such of a contrite spirit. Those, maybe I put it this way. The sins that you do not mourn over, you do not forfeit. The sins that you don't mourn over, you do not give up. So this blessedness of the comfort of God, of restoring your fellowship, the comfort when, when He grants you the power to overcome that sin because he, he sees your hatred, genuine hatred for it, the peace that God brings. So you see the, the, the paradox of the beatitude thus far is very contrary to the way the world thinks or even modern Christianity. But you cannot run away from the plain facts that God says, be poor in spirit, mourn and you will know the blessedness. All right, we, we can only end here. I intended to do more, but we have to stop here and continue again. Let's turn to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we pray that these quick revisions with the key points, Lord, will jog our memories. The memories of how you dealt with our hearts when we heard it during those messages. And to return, O oh Lord, once again, to realize how poor in spirit we are before you and how little we have been mourning over our sins. Oh Lord, we forfeit all this blessedness because, Lord, we do not want to think about our sins. We avoid thinking about them. And Lord, we pray that you will be merciful to help us to go forth and live this out in our lives. And Father, we pray that you meet with us in the place of prayer. We can do nothing. Without you, we are truly poor, genuinely poor destitute of being able to do anything right and good for your kingdom, unable to live our spiritual life unless you hear that people's poor cry begging you tonight, Lord, to be in our midst. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.